Well, good evening. Let me just say as we begin that um, these two messages are really to be heard and understood together. Um, Tom and I have been talking about this back and forth for quite a while, and it was really at times very difficult for us to decide how we were going to divide this up, partly because of the things that he mentioned early on in his message, uh, like the fact that this, this term has been really difficult to define. And that's been intentional. The reason it's been difficult to define is because the term is meant as a pejorative. The, the term is meant as an insult. Um, and so depending on who's doing the insulting and who they're trying to insult and why, uh, th- this, this term will, will, kind of, will kind of morph. Um, so what I want to do, you've, you've sort of gotten the, the foundation, the, the definitions, you see who the players are. I want to take this to a more a practical place. I first heard this term, I think, in uh, 2021. Um, I was here on a tour at the time. It was my winter tour, my January tour. Um, Fault Lines was about to come out uh, that spring. And so that whole tour, um, I was talking about Fault Lines. I was talking about the social justice movement. Um, I was talking about, you know, wokeism everywhere. Uh, we tried to line up a couple of debates. We eventually lined up, you know, uh, one debate. And even before we had lined up that debate, I had heard people talking about this idea of Christian nationalism. And the way that it came out made it obvious that it was a dodge, right? Because uh, social justice ideology um, had sort of won the day, if you will, around that time. Um, it, 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 was, it was everywhere. You know, people were putting up their, you know, things on, on social media and, um, you know, blacking out their, 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 their page on, on social media or whatever. Uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, people were participating in their marches and, you know, and using the, the, the phraseology and, and everything else. Um, but, but then there began to be pushback. And so around, you know, 2021, there was kind of an, an anti-woke movement, if you will. Uh, the Dallas Statement had, had come out and, you know, people had de- declared themselves one way or another based on the Dallas Statement on Social Justice and the Gospel. Um, and, and there was a legitimate group of people and a legitimate movement of people who were saying social justice is unbiblical. Social justice is a Trojan horse. Those who are promoting social justice are promoting something that is antithetical to biblical Christianity. And, and, and all of a sudden, when that pushback came, right, and, and, and this, you know, this debate was happening, because at first there just wasn't a lot of debate. At first, especially, you know, after George Floyd, um, anyone who said anything just got their head cut off, right? Um, but, but now there was a debate. And all of a sudden, you know, when there's this debate and when there's this pushback, um, we addressed the issue, for example, at Founders that year. All of a sudden, people started going, oh, yeah. Well, what about Christian nationalism? <laughs> I'm going, what about it? <laughs> Calling people that I know. What's this thing, this Christian nationalism thing? I mean, I live in Africa. Maybe y'all have, maybe y'all have started some stuff over there I need to be aware of. You know, I mean, like, you know, what, what's going on? So I began to look it up, and articles began to appear, uh, some of the voices, you know, that, 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 that Tom mentioned earlier, um, we're talking about Christian nationalism. Uh, uh, D- uh, Dumais' book, uh, Jesus and John Wayne, you know, people were just praising this book, Jesus and John Wayne, uh, because of it taking, you know, aim at Christian nationalism. So I got it and I read it. Um, 
but, but before that, again, I just, I was uncertain. Now, let me back up a little bit. When I first heard it, part of my inclination was to say, well, I mean, I might be, I might be right with you. And here's why. I served on staff at a church um, early on in, in, in my ministry. I served on staff at a church. That was one of these places that would, and you, you, you'll know this phrase, they, they, that would wrap the Bible and the cross in the flag. Amen? You know what I'm talking about? And I remember, you know, sitting through the service on the armed services day when, you know, you, we would have the, the flags from the different branches of the military and, you know, the band would come up and play the theme song from the various branches of the military and people would march up to the front on the Lord's day, right? Now, if it's the 4th of July and we're out there, man, come on now. You can't beat me getting to the front of that, right? I mean, I'm in there. My mother has two brothers. Both of them served in the United States Marine Corps. Hoorah. Yes, sir. (laughs) I, I, you know, they're just, you, yeah, but, but that's out there. This was happening in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. And I remember sitting there, just, I, I said to my wife, I think I'm going to get fired again. <laughs> Those who know me know that I got fired from my first church staff position. That's another story for another day. Um, but I, I, t- I did. I told her, I said, I, I think I'm going to get fired again. And, and I mean, I, at that time I didn't, uh, but, but I did, I, I, I pressed that issue, not in the Lord's house on the Lord's day. I mean, that's just, that's a no all day, every day, twice on Sunday. That's a no. I also pastor of a church that, you know, like this one, you didn't have flags up in the church. We didn't. We, we, didn't, we didn't do that. So on the one hand, when people said, you know, about this, this Christian nationalism thing, for me, on the one hand, that came into my mind, and I thought, yeah, we, we, we might have just found common ground, right? Because we were, we were going to war over this social justice thing, and now they were like, well, what about this Christian nationalism thing? And I'm like, I don't see what that has to do with this, but okay. We, we, you know, we might be, you know, on common ground. Now, let me, let me quickly say that I didn't have those positions and do those things because I was a pietist or because I am a pietist, because I believe that we, you know, shouldn't be involved or engaged in the political sphere, not by a long shot. Um, again, one of the founding Members of IOPT, one of the founding faculty of IOPT, I think this, this is incredibly important. So, again, just to give you some, 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 some background here and some, and some texture, right? Uh, I, I am that guy who, you know, not in the Lord's house on the Lord day, oh Lord's day, but at the same time, elder at a church where <laughs> every Lord's day, we took seriously uh, this admonition to pray for kings and those in authority. And so we divided the year up into three parts. And, you know, we would pray. You know, we spent 17 weeks praying for the executive branch and 17 weeks praying for the judicial branch and 17 weeks praying for the legislative branch, which meant we went 17 deep on the positions of people that we prayed for. By the way, federal, state, and local. It's hard to go 17 deep on the local executive branch. I'm going to tell you that right now, right? (laughs) And we would pray for these people in our service, and then we had a letter that we would send to them. Everybody who was in the service would sign the letter. We'd mail the letter to them, let them know that we just prayed for them. We'd point them to, you know, the scripture that encouraged us to pray for them. Interestingly enough, we started getting letters back from people. It was awesome. Sometimes it's little form letters. I remember that the the one that just stood out for everybody. We got a form letter back from uh, President Obama, you know, thanking us. And somebody said, he, he 
Somebody didn't tell him what we prayed. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, but we got to, and some, sometimes we, you know, we get letters back saying thank you, and oh, by the way, here's something you could be praying for. Sometimes people would come visit our church. Some people joined our church. Some people in our church got involved in the government on the local level. So I, I, I say all that to say, don't, don't hear me saying, you know, I'm the pietist who believes that there should never be, you know, any sort of connection, involvement whatsoever. But, but, but again, governed by the Word of God. It was alluded to earlier. Let me read it for us. Because I, I believe this. Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? And that, that's in, that, this is important too because, you know, as, as you heard earlier, um, one of the objections is to the idea of nations, right? To the idea that you could identify an American nation, let alone Christian nation. Um, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. We don't want to be controlled by God. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. There is a king above all kings. I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Do we believe that? That the nations are the Lord's heritage. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, in light of this, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Now, how can I read that and not believe that at least part of my duty is to call my nation to kiss the sun? And again, this, this term comes up, and I'm... I'm, I'm I'm hesitant, you know, to, to call myself that. It's funny. I was going to say the same thing that, that Tom did. You know, I remember when people would ask me, you know, are you, are you a Calvinist? My response was always exactly the same. What do you mean by that? How are you defining that? Because could be, depending on what you mean by that and how you're trying to use that. So here are these popular teachers using this term. And then the lights came on as I realized how the term morphed and as I saw who was using the term. Same people who were in the woke mob were now using this terminology. And it was as though, you know, they had gotten in the huddle and called a play. everybody started talking about nationalism on three. Ready, pray, right? And they just, you know, and all of them, these books that they were pointing to, you go and you read and, and, and just think, surely these people couldn't have read this book. Surely they couldn't have. But there was a point to this, especially when they started using the term white Christian nationalism. Then, then it all fit. This was all part of the same game. Because w within 
neo-Marxism, within Gramscian Marxism, within this whole critical theory world and this critical race theory world, knowledge is a construct. Knowledge is constructed. Truth is a construct. Morality is a construct. And these constructs exist in order to establish hegemony. Hegemony is the power structure that is used by those in power to oppress those who are on the outside. The concept of the nation is a construct. And it's a construct that's part of this hegemony. And so if, if you've seen, I don't know if you've seen these oppression wheels. Can we get the, uh, the oppression wheel up here? I don't know if you've seen these, these oppression wheels, right? Um, but in case you haven't, and this is, I just pulled, you know, an example uh, of an oppression wheel up here. And what you see in the middle is the position of privilege, right? And the further you get out from the middle, the less privilege you have. In the, in the middle is the hegemony. In, in, in the middle you have those things that have been established, not because they're true, because there is no truth. Truth is a construct, okay? Truth is a construct. It's not a real thing. So whatever a particular culture believes to be true, they believe that to be true because those who established the hegemony established that as the truth in order to consolidate their power, period, okay? Now, in all of this, in all of this, the main culprit is Christianity. Now, this particular wheel, I just noticed, didn't have uh, religion on it, but, but often they'll have religion on it. And on the outside is, the, or in the inside, rather, the privileged position is Christian. And then outside is other forms of religion. Now, what, what you'll notice, you know, you have sexuality, you have gender, um, and as Tom read earlier in Taking America Back for God, uh, they, they reference cisgender as part of this ideology, okay? But notice citizenship. C- citizenship in what? The nation. On the inside, citizen, right? Then permanent resident, precarious status. <laughs> Don't you love that? And then outside, no status. You're not part of the nation, okay? Um, skin color. On the inside, it's white. Uh, and then on the outside, it's persons of color. Why do I point this out? Because white Christian nationalism is a triple word score. Especially, again, that's why you have to add white, okay? And white is the most important part of this because, again, in our particular context, whiteness identifies those who established the hegemony. Christian identifies the system, the ideology that whites use to establish the hegemony. And nationalism identifies the, 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 the borders around this particular hegemonic power. So white Christian nationalism is a triple word score, and it all has to do with oppression. This is not something different. It's the same thing. This is critical theory and cultural Marxism talking about white Christian nationalism. Now, having said that, I want to do a couple of things here. First, the idea that a a nation is something that's hard to define, that you you can't really define America as a nation. Oxford English Dictionary defines a nation as a large body of people united by common descent, history, culture, or language inhabiting a particular country or territory. We use phrases like, and, and this, they use this example in the Oxford Dictionary of the English language, the world's leading industrialized nations. 
That's just, it's common usage, right? European nations, the United Nations, right? Again, it's sheer folly for someone to argue against Christian nationalism based at least in part on the idea that it's difficult or even impossible to identify an American nation. Okay? We can go back beyond that to Webster's 1828. Uh, uh, I, I call it the, the homeschooler's dictionary. <laughs> you, you, you go in the homeschooler's house, you're going to see that big old green Webster's 1828 dictionary. You walk in there, you go, you, you guys homeschool, right? How did you know? Yeah, just, it's the book, man. It's the, you know, it's the, it's the book. A body of people inhabiting the same country or united under the same sovereign or government as the English nation, the French nation. Often happens that many subjects will be, uh, uh, will be part of, of one government, in which case the word nation usually denotes a body of people speaking the same language. Uh, again, on and on and on and on. That's what this is. Now, at its root, nation also earlier on referred to people of a particular stock. So, 1828 nation, as its etymology imports, originally denoted a family or race of men descended from a common progenitor, like tribe. But by immigration, conquest, and intermixture of men of different families, this is in 1828, this distinction is in most countries lost. That's in 1828. In 1828, they're going, yeah, 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 I mean... You know, if you, if you push this back to its etymology, right, you can talk about nations of men in reference to ethnicity. But, but by 1828, they're going, you know, because of, because of, you know, intermixture and conquest and all the rest of that, that, that's a very rare thing. Why do I make that point? Because the people who are trying to argue against the very concept of an American nation you need to realize that what they're doing is they're forcing that definition. And the reason they force that definition is because they're arguing against white Christian nationalism with the emphasis on the white. Does that make sense? That, 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 that's why. By the way, um, I am the resident in a Christian nation. For the last seven years, I've lived in Zambia. Listen to this from the preamble of the Constitution of the Republic of Zambia. We, the people of Zambia, acknowledge the supremacy of God Almighty, declare the Republic a Christian nation, while upholding a person's right to freedom of conscience, belief, or religion. Here's why this is interesting. Because the triple word score, white Christian nationalism, tries to imply that the very concept of Christian nationalism is something that somehow, you know, emanates from America because, because, because America is trying to use it to oppress people. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm just wondering. I just want to ask them. <laughs> what, what, what are my deep, dark, chocolate Zambian brethren trying to do? <laughs> the idea of a secular nation is a very recent idea. All the way back in biblical times, right? You, you, you're going to war with another nation. It was always understood that your people and your God were going to war against their people and their God. That's why people sacked one another's temples. That's why in Daniel, right? <laughs> There's the big party and the, and the big party happens and go get that stuff from their temple. was always understood. Again, the idea of a secular nation 
That is a very recent concept. It's one that hasn't worked very well. Well, the Zambians, where, 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 where are they getting this from? Interestingly enough, from some white folks. <laughs> Until 1964, they, like we, were a British colony. I want to read something for you. Uh, King Charles III. In this tra- does, does anybody else... Does anybody, again, this is a complete aside here. But the the queen reigned for so long. Does anybody else find it weird saying that England has a king? You're like, oh yeah, that's a thing, right? And then it's Charles. (laughs) But but I digress, right? Listen, Listen to this. Listen to this oath that, that he took. I, Charles III, by the grace of God, of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and of Northern Ireland and of my other realms and territories, king, defender of the faith, do faithfully promise and swear that I shall inviolably maintain and preserve the settlement of the true Protestant religion as established by the laws of Scotland in prosecution of the claim of rights and particularly an act instituted, an act of securing the Protestant religion and Presbyterian church government and by acts passed in both kingdoms for the union of the two kingdoms together with the government, worship, discipline, rights, and privileges of the church of Scotland. So help me God. Again, we, we just made this up in America, right? And, and we, just, we just made this up for the purpose of oppression. Interestingly enough, again, that's not new. Amen? Charles didn't just invent that oath among all the other oaths that he took, he wanted the Church of England as well. But he, he, Charles didn't just invent that oath. That oath has been taken by kings in Great Britain for hundreds of years. Why is that important? It's important because, again, people are arguing that this idea is something that is new, something that is made up, something that we're forcing, for example, on America and on America's history. But you, you can only believe that if you're ignorant of who came here and established America and why. For example, the Mayflower Compact. Again, not, not in the name of God, amen, we whose names are underwritten, the loyal subjects of our dread sovereign Lord King James, by the grace of God of Great Britain, France, Ireland, King, defender of the faith, etc. Again, this, this is in 1620, and it's the same language that Charles just spoke not long ago having undertaken for the glory of God an advancement of the Christian faith and the honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colony in the northern parts of Virginia, do by these presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for the better ordering and preservation and furtherance of the ends aforesaid. In other words, we're establishing ourselves as a body politic in order to advance the goal that we just said, which was what? The advancement of the kingdom. And and again, what's the argument that we often hear? The argument that we often hear is, yes, yes, that might have been true. And I, 
either these people didn't really mean it or that was then, but everything changed later on. Everything's changed later on because, you know, we, we have the First Amendment. And clearly the First Amendment was established by a group of people who had recognized the superiority of secularism. Because they were secularist and deist and whatnot, they, they, they knew better. They knew better than to try to establish some kind of religion. Well, that's one possibility. But there's another possibility. And before I tell you what that possibility is, let me just give you a few more pieces of information. Connecticut was founded by Puritans. And they said specifically, to gather, to maintain, and pursue the liberty and purity of the gospel of our Lord Jesus, which we now profess, as also the discipline of the churches, which, according to the truth of the said gospel, is now practiced among us. It just sounds like a secular people who couldn't wait to get rid of religion in the First Amendment. Delaware didn't establish a particular church. But they declared a right to religious freedom exclusively for those who, quote, profess to believe in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. Georgia was officially a, a Protestant state. But they required their public office holders to be Protestant. Maryland was originally founded by Catholics. But was formed as an explicitly Christian nation requiring its new constitution, in its new constitution that public office holders declare a belief in the Christian religion. Massachusetts was a Puritan Congregationalist colony. New Hampshire agreed to be governed by godly and Christian laws. New York, founded as New Netherlands, codified religious liberty for all Christians. New Jersey required that its public office holders be Protestants. North Carolina also had a religious test. Pennsylvania also had a religious test. Rhode Island also required that their office holders be Protestants in good standing with local churches. South Carolina declared Protestantism, Protestantism to be its official religion. And Virginia was officially Anglican. So, did all of these people come together and decide, listen, we've been wrong all these years, and what we need to do is come together and establish a secular state? Or did they say, because we as individual states have state religions, or official Christian practices and policies. We don't need our federal government to establish one for everybody. You tell me which one of those things makes more sense. And again, this does not mean that we jump onto this bandwagon that says, you know, America is this special nation, or America is this new Israel, or America is this whatever. Wrap the Bible and the cross and the flag? Absolutely not. But it's just as ridiculous to try to argue that foundationally, fundamentally, that our roots are anything but Christian. Which, by the way, is a beautiful thing. Anybody who's been to an Islamic Republic will tell you. And here's the great irony. People who have a problem with Christian nationalism, however they want to define it, one of the arguments being made is that Christian nationalism is dangerous because Christian nationalism excludes people and takes liberty away from people when nothing could be further from the truth. 
It's, it's the Christian West where people have liberty. I've preached at churches in the Middle East. I preached at churches in the Middle East, some of which were in countries that will allow Christians to worship. And in those countries in the Middle East where they will allow Christians to worship, in Islamic republics, for example, they will allow them to worship only in specific places that are under government control and supervision. And if you get outside of those boundaries, you'll be on the next flight out. But they don't allow Jews. They don't allow Jews. Christian nations do. Why? Why? Because Christianity is not ethnic in nature. And Christianity is rooted and grounded in the gospel that calls all men everywhere to repent. Christianity does not force men to worship. Christianity recognizes that men are called by faith to worship God. Sunday, I was preaching in Fort Lauderdale at Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church. And after the service, a lady brought another woman up to me. And this woman, well, she was crying. She was laughing. She was just like, she, she was just all over the place. And so the woman who brought her, introduced her to me, told me her name, and was about to tell me more about her, when the lady just said to me, she said, I'm from Iran. And the lady goes, yes, and she, you know, she's from Iran, and this is her first, and the lady goes, this is my first time setting foot in a church. She said, I don't know if you know what's going on in Iran right now where people are being executed every day. Women are being raped and murdered every day because of not wearing their head coverings or because of not wearing them the right way, because of these protests that are going on and these things that are happening in Iran. And she's just, she's just going on. She's just so passionate about what's been going on. And she says, you know, these things made me question the Quran. And I just thought, this religion can't be true. This religion can't be right. And I began to read, and I began to study, and I began to, and, and, and she said, and, and, just, and, just, and she finally just gets to the place in her story, and she says, I, I don't know, I just, I decided, I'm going to the church. And so this morning, I came to the church, and she said, I, I heard you, I heard what you said. <laughs> and this Iranian Muslim woman placed our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ on Sunday. And, and, and part of what God used in this journey was her for, and I don't know how long she's been in America, but she's been free in what she called a Christian country. That, that's, that's the fruit of our legacy. Here's the final thing. Here's the final thing. And this is not another one of the insidious things that people do. Is they'll say things like, you know, how can you say that America has been Christian when America did dot, dot, dot? Folks, don't fall for that. Don't fall for the idea that Christianity requires sinless perfection. Amen? Because if we play that game, and again, I'm not saying that nations can be Christian like people are Christian. 
That, that's, that's, that's the other thing. That's the other thing that we just don't, you know, well, nations are not Christian, people are Christian, because Christianity is about, you know, we're not saying that. We're not saying that. We're talking about the ethos. We're not saying that everybody in the nation is Christian. We're not saying that everything the nation does is Christian. We're saying that the general ethos from the founding on was rooted and grounded in Christianity. That's what we're saying. That's what we're saying. And by the way, because of that, there have been many instances where the nation by and large has been able to be called back to its roots and challenged. For example, in the civil rights movement. Was that an argument? You get back to your secularist roots. So again, if you want to know the answer to the question, am I a Christian nationalist? The answer to the question is, maybe. (laughs) Depends on who's asking. Depends on why you're asking. And it depends on the definition that you're using. Like Tom said, there are some things that I see that just make my skin crawl. And I just want to run and say, whoever they are, I'm not with them. And if that's the, if, if that's the definition that we're using, then there are very few people who would say, yeah, I'm that. Very few people. But for others, like with some of these books that we read, you know, these, these, these six questions, and, and I, re- I remember reading, you know, Taking America Back for God, and I'm looking at these six questions that they're asking, and, and I'm going, how, how are you not? And by the way, in these questions that they asked about, you know, white Christian nationalism, uh, a large number of Jews surveyed were white Christian nationalists. Because of the ridiculous questions that they used in order to make that determination. So yeah, it depends on who's asking. But at the end of the day, this is a power play. And we should not, we should not bow to the power play. We need to be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And by all means, don't let people use this, what is often a fake question, a complete sleight of hand to make you back off or to make you ashamed to be a part of this wonderful republic. Because God's been good to us. Amen? Amen? God's been good to us. And I, for one, am grateful. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your goodness, for your mercy and your kindness to us, individually, corporately, collectively, and as a nation. We thank you for the ways that you have showered your grace upon us. For the ways that even in the midst of our darkest days, there's been the freedom and liberty of the gospel. We recognize that there is no perfect nation. We recognize that we are not your chosen people. We recognize that in an ultimate since on America's best day, it's still Egypt. It's not our home. And yet, you called your people, even in the midst of exile, to pray for the peace of the nation where you had sent them into exile. Certainly, if you called your people Israel to pray 
for the peace of Babylon while they were in exile in the midst of Babylon. Certainly, you call us your people in the midst of this free and prosperous land where the gospel has flourished to pray for its peace. To pray that you would give us leaders who are godly, laws that are righteous, churches that are free. And we pray this not because we believe that this is our ultimate home, but in spite of the fact that we know it's not. And so we do pray for the peace and prosperity of this land and of whatever land you may choose to plant us in. Because we recognize ultimately that Jesus is the King of kings and our desire is that he might have the fullness of the reward for which he died and that all the nations would be his. Because we know that ultimately they all will. And so we pray this, and we ask this, and we believe this, and we hope this. In Christ's name and for his sake. Amen.